All right. Good evening. I'm going to call to order the uh, Rally Planning Board meeting. Uh, it's a special meeting uh, for Monday, July 30th, 7:30. Uh, there's one item on the uh, agenda this evening. So off the top, we have a continued public hearing for the site plan review for a large scale. Solar photovoltaic facility at 623, 607, 599, 615 Weathersfield Street map and lot 5-13, uh, pardon me, 1153, 1158, 1158-1, 1158-2A, 1158-2, and 1163, all in the outlying zoning district. So uh, from the top, I have it the, uh, for the applicant, Tom Beatrice, attorney. Tom Beatrice. Evening. Mr. Planchet is here to address the comments of uh, Mr. Graham. By the way, well, actually, I, I think I do, wouldn't mind. Uh, if we could just start with uh, Larry. Would you mind take a look at the comments? We're going over the comments that you made based on the, the submission they made uh, at the last meeting. Sure. And uh, would it be best to Larry have to respond in order <coughs> to your comments, or uh, I'll just uh, I can I can respond to. Uh, Mr. Blanchett's uh, candidate in his letter. Okay. Want to do that way? Sure. Uh, Larry Graham, Patreon Graham Associates, and uh, technical review agent for the planning board. Uh, we got a letter out dated July 25th, and that was in review of the last set of plans, and that should be considered a, uh, a full, comprehensive review. And uh, Camet Engineering answered uh, today. Uh, I received a set of plans as well as a letter addressing the comments of my January 25th report. I have not looked at them uh, specifically in any detail, but I'm going to just uh, generally say that they have, uh, by the narrative in their letter, uh, appears to have addressed all the items in my Janu in my July 25th review, and I will look at those uh, responses uh, more specifically in detail for the next meeting. Very good. So, uh, one item that you did note in the uh, in your comments in the full review was that. Uh, we had the concrete converter and transformer pad was within 140 feet, uh, and yet where the zoning bylaw requires 150 foot setback, were you able to relocate that? Yes, yes we have. Give us just a. So previously the pad was located uh, in this vicinity. We moved it back such that it's, it's at least 150 feet from Mr. Cassidy's rolling farm. Very good. We also had. Uh, Quite a few comments regarding uh, the erosion control, uh, particularly as it related to the access drive. Yep. So we've uh, we've added all the uh, additional erosion control as recommended in Mr. Graham's letter. Uh, it included erosion control around detention basin one, which is sitting here, uh, right at the three-way erosion control. There's still wall here, there's still wall erosion control. Additional road control along the, the northern boundary and uh, for a distance from uh, the northern boundary down to the Concord 74, uh, additional erosion control measures. Now, Will, I should, I, I, I should note that the, when I met with the Conservation Commission, they had actually asked that I, I remove erosion control measures from the plan. I, I, we had significantly more like linear feet of erosion control measures. And the conclusion was uh, the, the tree clearing activity will occur first. Uh, once that's finished, uh, then the erosion control measures will be installed in accordance with the plan. A site visit will then be made by the agent, and then we'll adjust the location of the erosion control measures at that point before any more work continues. Okay, good. So you work so, with that board to, uh, to correct. modify whatever location. That's right. Need. So uh, I'm making that point because when I present this plan tomorrow night to the Conservation Commission, let them know we added more erosion control measures. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. Uh, they may ask why. And, of course, you know, the answer is we're accommodating the board's peer review engineer. 
Not that that's a bad thing, but they may ask for more adjustments, possibly remove some of the erosion control measures, uh, because their jurisdiction ends at the 100-foot buffer zone. Okay. Right. And, and is, is there any this erosion control in that 100-foot buffer zone? Uh, s some is, some isn't, some is outside of it, which which is fine. It's 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 not a problem. Fine. There was a significant concern about the grade on the driveway uh, where it uh, passed the curb cut over the there's, the, there's a swale out front along, uh, along Leathersfield Street, mm -hmm. and, and then it it's got a, it goes up a grade. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we have, what we're proposing is a, a gravel driveway. Uh, it'll be constructed of uh, gravel composition. It's called three-inch minus. It's a, you know, maximum particle size of three inches, smaller particle sizes all the way down to pea stone gravel. The material will be compacted in place, and the, uh, the proposed grade for uh, the first 150 feet or so of the driveway is, is 10%. Uh, 10% is not uncommon. Uh, 10% road grades are, are everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't personally have a concern regarding, you know, erosion. Uh, but in order to alleviate any concerns, we start with, with what's called a, a water bar. Uh, essentially, it's a device that runs perpendicular across the roadway and diverts a portion of the stormwater runoff into the nearest stormwater system. Uh, uh, Mr. Graham had brought up that possibly, you know, there's still concern even with one water bar. So in this last revision, we added two additional water bars just to assure that uh, any... So a water bar, I think I can understand, but just a diverter that... Uh, Essentially, yes. to the roadway. Exactly, to, that's right. Yep. Uh, is it perforated and built with subsurface? Oh, I'm or sorry. It's, so it's, it's buried in the gravel driveway medium. Yep. It's made out of rubber. Stands up on its own. When okay. it's driven over by a vehicle, it collapses and then springs back into shape. Gotcha. Uh, cheap to install, easy to maintain, but very, very effective. Mr. Graham, do you con uh, concur that that's a, a solution that I concur with it? And he's added uh, two additional of uh, these uh, 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 water bars in locations which I suggested. Uh, essentially, though, that it's a bit of an, an angle on the driveway, and what it will do is divert it off to the swale to the right. I still have my concerns about it, and I intend to cover those as the uh, board has tasked me with helping you with the uh, uh, specific conditions. So sure. my uh, thoughts right now are that uh, we should probably have, until my concerns are alleviated, uh, some type of uh, maintenance uh, a maintenance guarantee on that. Does that seem something we can... Uh, yeah, and so in, in, in the stormwater, uh, the, the uh, stormwater management uh, O&M, uh, in the latest revision, I added up several paragraphs that describe uh, how to inspect it, um, how to maintain it. Uh, there's a detail on the plan, of course, and I can provide you with, with, with the design guide. It's right from the NRCS, the National... Uh, resource conservation service. So, all right. Okay, and uh... oh, uh, I should add, we did um, elect to add a paved, uh, uh, a bituminous concrete paved apron at the beginning of this uh, entryway. Okay, uh, where we're we're proposing so. The swale along the north side of Weathersfield Street, it isn't quite deep enough to support a culvert, a pipe culvert. Otherwise, that would have been our, our go-to design uh, effort would have been for a culvert. Uh, so what the, um, the resultant design actually, the pavement meets the Weathersfield Street pavement and then conforms to the swale and then up into the site. So we've elected to pave that first, I believe it's 25 feet, from the edge of Weathersfield Street to the gate. Right, and and is the swale, does that first 25 feet... The it covers the swale, or is yes. the swale beyond it? No, nope, okay. the swale is within that first 25 feet. So water that's in that swale will just traverse it, across the... It's going to run right right across. Okay. That's right. And given the amount of times this driveway is going to be used and the types of vehicles that are going to use it, uh, it's unlikely there'll they'll be an issue. Is this just this, a... This is, uh, this is what you call a forward, forward crossing. Mm -hmm. I would never recommend this uh, to the board for approval for any other type of use other than something like this with the very low traffic use and primarily for operation and maintenance uh, personnel. 
Gotcha. So certainly not something that was going to be used every day, but no, given the, the no. schedule. Yeah, uh, again, escape. we wouldn't normally expect that. What about uh, emergency vehicles? They can get across it? Yeah, like, that, so that first one, yeah. real shallow. Yeah, it's not okay. uh, substantial enough to hang up okay. uh, an uh, emergency vehicle. I have a, uh, like to raise an issue of the bucket bathing portion of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I know what Mr. Graham's feeling is. I'm curious as to what the board's feeling is. Excuse me, these people are allowed to be whether <clears throat> bathing uh, as opposed to an impervious surface is appropriate in that area in terms of drainage. Um, I'm going to defer to the experts on that. It's, it's, it's a very small area. The, the roadway itself, uh, the, the difference between paved and a compacted gravel roadway as far as the numbers that uh, Bob and I use for calculations are you know, 96, 98 percent, whatever. Uh, but the, the reason for the paving is, is primarily so that the water in the swale on the north side of uh, Weathersfield Street does not continually pick up the fines in the gravel driveway and carry them on down. Right. End up with a, a road that uh, could be comp a drive or a road that could be compromised a bit, as well as continually washing off fines from the driveway. So and that's why it's being paid. That, uh, that's how I understood it as well, just to prevent the sediment from that would come down that slope. And it, and and is that, it sounds like it's something you're willing to engineer into the into the plan. So it's already on the revised plan, plan. right? The, yeah. the sure, fair enough. I have a question uh, regarding the, the stump grinding. Uh, pardon me, stump removal. What's, you know, I know that I see Mr. Graham's comments on this, that there might be some on-site uh, grinding of stumps. What's, do you have a plan in place, or is it just going to determine once once the project begins? Uh, so it'll be determined once, once the project starts, because right now we don't know which stumps must come out and which can be left behind. It's all going to rely on the layout of the, the solar field. Um, I did speak with a a site contractor that um, that uh, specializes in tree removal, demolition, uh, on-site uh, on stump grinding. Mm -hmm. And he said it's generally not an issue to, to grind a whole stump and leave it on-site. So we like to specify that on our erosion control plans because those wood chips, not only do they not have to be hauled off-site, but they can be used for erosion control. So, you know, in areas that are disturbed by the movement of equipment, uh, instead of you know, blasting hydro seed or hauling in mulch material, we'll have a pile of it already available for the, the site contractor to use. Troy, what do you think? Are you mentioning? Uh... As I understand it, stump grindings uh, screw up the pH of soil. So the only thing you're really going to get to grow is saplings or invasive species. I mean, I'd suggest to haul anything. That you're I wasn't pull aware out. of that. Okay. Yeah. Is it uh, all species of trees or, yes. or all species of trees? Hmm. I, I think grinding stumps is real time consuming as well. I mean, okay. So you're using it to pop them out and haul them away, grind them out. way. I'm, I'm getting my directive just from, from one okay. source, so I don't, I don't know truly how. Yeah. I, mean, I think I would like to own because I have my own experience with uh, stump stump grinding, and, and it, it makes horrible fill. You don't get anything to grow in it. I would certainly, and it eventually breaks down and like sinkholes. So it's not, you know, it, it's not a long term solution, uh, and it certainly is not going to help your fill issues. But uh, Larry, do you have any? Uh, well, I had a conversation with Brent, and I think uh, Brent's opinion or idea is outside of the array fields, but in the cleared area that they need to clear for, for the sun, that uh, he would prefer stumps to be taken right down to the ground and left in the ground, uh, and then that requires a maintenance uh, to uh, go around and, and occasionally cut the shoots Something. that come out of the stump. But uh, that will minimize uh, additional excavation and uh, perhaps erosion. Uh, but under the array fields, the panels, uh, 
I think the stumps are either going to have to be removed or ground, and then if they're ground enough uh, soil that will support the vegetation that they need to establish under the panels. You know, so uh, I think that the stump grinding is something that we should leave in there as an option. It's how it's completed that becomes uh, the specification for a completion. So if, if I may, there are two elements at play. One is uh, determining which stumps need to come out, you know, which ones interfere with the frame of the uh -huh. solar panel system. And the other is maintenance thereafter. So, you know, the stumps, it, it's fine to cut them flush as long as we can get a mower across the top and not inhibit the mower. Uh -huh. uh, the stumps under the framework, uh, you know, when shoots start to come back, you know, maybe those need to be hand clipped or something. I mean, you're going to have stumps anyways. You're going to stump the entire driveway coming in. You're going to have a pile right. of stumps exactly. anyways. So. Right. All right, well, we'll work through that. But I think... Uh, which one's cheaper? Stop maintenance agreement. Awesome. No, I think grind is more expensive. Grind is expensive. It's time consuming. Grind it really is. Expensive. It's easier to pull yeah. them out and even have a grinder come in. Okay, and yesterday they were talking yeah. about 20 minutes each time. All right, we'll, we'll consult with, the, <coughs> or excuse me, consult with our, our site contractor and make that determination. The, the, uh, I, I want to just add the only thing about pulling them all out, and if it was uh, if, if that's what ends up being done, uh, is that you've got a big cavity to fill. Sure. And there is no proposed cut on this site and then take off a couple of knobs. Well, I mean, this so, whole driveway needs to be, all the organics in the yeah, driveway need right, to be stripped, exactly. so you're going to have all of that. There'll be some cut in the drive, but I don't know if there's yeah, going to be I mean, enough. You have to strip it. Yeah, right. You have to haul it in. You have to take point. it. You may have to haul some in if they pull all the yeah. stumps out. I think you'll be okay. I think it's probably going to be a net fill site. Um, I agree. I, I don't believe there's enough cut in the driveway to fill the stump holes. But it's not really happening with the stump, right? oh, Okay. Good. And then we'll, we'll work on what makes the most sense, and if, then you'll work with your people to figure out which sure. works as well. Yeah. Mr. Graham, in response to... Uh, Pardon me, uh, looking over their response from today, is there anything else that you wanted to comment on specifically? No. No, I think we've covered. So another uh, item that's been, I shouldn't say item, but uh, the butter, uh, Mr. Cassiotis has uh, uh, provided a, a letter that I think is worth some comment. Uh, his, they put some, some thought into this, and... and uh, as an abutter, they've asked us to take particular consideration for the, uh, the visual screening and fencing that uh, affects the area, as well as uh, quite a list of other comments. But specifically, as it relates to the uh, to the screening of the site, uh, can you, if you would? Uh, First of all, uh, not to interrupt you, Mr. Chair. Sure. I just was handed a copy of this letter today. Okay. And you'll notice the applicant was copied on the letter for some reason. Yeah. Uh, other than uh, the delay, I assume. I mean, I see the letter is dated today, so uh, it came to my office as well. We have, we have email. But, uh, sure. In any event, um, we have, uh, I believe, discussed the issue of screening uh, ad nauseum over the course of I don't know how many meetings. Uh, and it appears that a lot of, if not all, the natural vegetation, the vegetation will be left as a natural screen. Uh, the only, and then I'm trying to be as reasonable as possible, the only area is here, I think, that's fairly close to the lot line. But we also have the remaining forest in here. Correct. I don't see... I can understand the concern, but I don't see what the actual issue is, to be honest with you. Well, I feel as though we, you know, in being at the site twice, both in the winter, uh, and I think the first time we were out there was uh, the middle of winter, there was no foliage on the trees, am I right? And uh, since then we've been there a while, there is uh, the full foliage. It seems like the there's quite a bit, particularly this time of year, there's, there's quite a bit of natural screening that's in place. Uh, substantial. Substantial. I'm Diane Prince and I live on Moore Street. Okay. Um, I have asked on occasion um, about the forest street. 
and that's never been addressed. Well, it, it shouldn't, and I'm not, I mean, from Forest Street, I think there's over 560 feet. But no, it goes down and it goes up. So we're going to see, so 500 feet is, is not how the crow flies. Because we've got the, the hill that's going to go down and the hill that goes up. So it's not, I mean, Ray is on the hill that's up. So in the winter, the part that's down is not visible. So we're going to see straight into the array. And especially along that edge and the corner that turns. I'm on, I'm on the corner, so I'm going to see right into that array. But isn't it pretty thickly uh, no. vegetated in there? There's pine trees, there's, low, there's scrub pines. There's... Uh, yeah. If I may, uh, sure. Mr. Chairman, uh, one of the first sight walks we made was, uh, it was either late fall, early winter, yeah. and uh, Kim and Jerry had marked the uh, limit of the array corners. You know, if you remember the first design, we had it in this vicinity. Yes. We had marked these corners, actually visited those corners, uh, and looked towards Forest Street, and we couldn't see any homes through the through the forest. I was on that side. I was on that side, and I could see. I was there with most of it. Yeah. Well, just from a practical matter, and I totally understand the concern, if there's natural vegetation for 560 feet, adding a dozen trees to what's already there, it's not going to make any difference. I, it's but it's not 560 feet because most of it is the forest floor. I mean, the measurements. My measurements. The measurements so, I mean, it's not exaggerated yeah. in any way. It's 500. Yeah, so I'm looking at the forest floor, and the rain is up here. So when winter comes, all, all we're going to see, and there are no evergreens up there. The few that were there are down. You're going to see the array. And my bedroom, every morning I wake up, and the sun is shining right in my bedroom. And that's where the array is going to be. So not only am I going to see the array, but I'm going to have to glare from the array. So what's your solution? You My solution it? is that we had talked about this and it had been agreed at some point that there would be screening so that we wouldn't see this fence and this corner. This is also a butters up here. I don't know how this is further away. But here, we're going to see this because this is far as forth. And if you come to my house, I'll show you. But how tall the trees would they need? Wouldn't they need like... Not very. <coughs> You're looking down. I'm looking down. <coughs> You're looking down. Okay. Mr. Bailich, Blanchett, the, the, the tops of the panels are how high? And if I understand, they're, they're between 6 and 12 feet off the ground? Uh, not even. Not even? Um, 6 feet. The average height is about 6 feet off the ground. 6 feet off, okay. Yeah. And the chain link fence that's going to surround the entire uh, ar array is equal. Is also six feet. Uh, it's, a, seven. it's a seven foot fence. Seven foot fence. Uh, not to jump around, but you've also addressed uh, wildlife access. Yeah. So there's a. Yeah. I heard six inches. Someone whispered six. So the, there's a six inch gap under the fence. The fence fabric itself is seven feet. Okay. So in totality, it's you could say seven and a half feet. And as far as the material you're going to use for the fencing, I mean, I know it's chain link, galvanized is it, one of the options. It's either galvanized or vinyl coated. Vinyl coated. Have you considered a, a mesh screen? Uh, we had talked about that when we had a larger proposal, um, but as the proposal got smaller and we gained more natural vegetation, it seemed. I, I think a screen will stick out more than you'd. You're not going to gain anything from a screen, right? Yeah, no, I just, just, uh... Mr. Chairman, I mean, the natural vegetation to a great extent has to be higher than seven feet. I would think so. It is. We, we actually did a tree height study on site, and the average tree height was about 75 feet. Mr. Graham, we got any uh, comments on yeah, the sight lines? I don't know if the board has the 11 by 17s here. Yeah. But as, uh, with respect to this last concern of an abutter, uh, the plans are, are indicating horizontal distance. It's, it's not, it is as the crow flies. It's the horizontal distance. And, and the northerly point of array field one is 579 feet shown, and that's from the property line. Uh, 
and 75 feet of that 579 from the property line is their clearing. So their, their limit of clearing, for instance, on sheet C1.22, if you look at C122, so somewhat in the middle of that array field that's shown on that sheet, the elevation is 76. And opposite that elevation at the limit of clearing, the elevation is somewhere between, say, 66 and 70. So the array field is 10 feet higher than where they're clearing. But that's a clearing limit of trees which may be 20, 30, 75 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And my judgment on this is that the existing vegetation, and it will be a condition of their approval that this clearing limit be uh, marked in the field and not be strayed there from during the construction. But my take on it is that the limit of clearing and at that point with a 50, 75 foot tree is going to block the view of the right here, uh, in in the area that we're speaking about. And the same goes for the dimension to the south of array field number one, which is 491 feet from the property line minus the 75. So you've got roughly 500 and 400. And I agree that if the uh, clearing limit was brought way down into the lower topography near the wetlands, that this might be of concern. But they are leaving a considerable amount of area between the wetland and their limit of clearing to establish a natural screen. And that's my view. Thank you. No, that gives us better, better understanding of what's going to happen out there. Well, I think we'll... Uh, I do have more comments on the... Yeah, please, we can just this, deal with the, the response the to the... Of field number two. Go ahead, continue. Uh, on, on the screening of array field number two, uh, Right now they're showing that they're leaving approximately 40 feet of natural vegetation between the, the butter uh, Cassiotis and um, uh, from their property line approximately 40 feet away from Cassiotis the butter to the south. Um, then a little bit to the east, halfway across that common property line, then they go right to the property line because they have to construct a firm for a retention basin there. Uh, so as I see that particular sensitive area, they are leaving 40 feet of natural vegetation between Cassiotis' house and the array field. Between the lot line, if I may correct you. Uh, but Well, they're leaving 40 feet of natural vegetation on their property. Yes. North of their lot line. Uh, and that will shield the view of Cassiotis' house from array field number two. Now, from their barn and their paddock, where their horses are, their fenced area, that is basically going to be clear cut right to the property line. So they walk down there and they are definitely going to see the array field. But I do see some natural vegetation being left according to the plans that will provide some screening from Cassiotis to Rayfield number two. Topography wise, the Rayfield number two appears to be at about the same elevation, the high point about the same elevation as Cassiotis' house. So it goes down, the topography goes down and then comes back up to where Rayfield two is gonna be positioned. Those trees are lower, but they are pretty substantial trees. Now, mm -hmm. Somewhere back around April or May of this year, uh, previous plans indicated where uh, trees, which are still in the plans right now on the detail sheets, but the previous plans in 
prior to April or May of this year indicated where they might be placed. After that, only the detail of the trees remained in the plans on one of the latter sheets. Uh, I think that uh, there could be an additional effort by the applicant here to place those trees along the fencing, if you will, uh, immediately south of array field number two without impacting uh, the, the sun which they need to get onto the array field. Their trees are specced in here at 10 to 12 feet uh, mature height, six foot spacing. So I don't see where a 10 or 12 foot height tree immediately along the fence line to afford some additional screening between the Cassiotis property and Rayfield 2 would be harmful. And I would recommend that. Sure, please. From the driveway. Area, yes, that entire. Uh, given that we have the 40 feet here, would it not be sufficient to have the trees in this particular area without planting here? Is it being slightly redundant with respect to the 40 feet? No, no I don't think it is. Uh, again, uh, I know there's a lot of pines out there, especially around the Rayfield one <coughs> and up here too as well. Um, so you're going to have some loss of leaves and so forth in, in winter time. I don't, I'm not saying locate it directly against the fence. Uh, you can keep it a little further south, but fairly close to the fence, all the way across. What, how long is that bound? Or not bound, but the edge of the array field? That fence line there? Yeah. That's a 10 foot post. That's about 350 feet. 220. Yep. 250. Yeah. So, if we were to ask you to put some arborvitae in there along that fence line, something we can work with. Hey, that. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. They they specced all along, and the board previously uh, gave them some direction on the type of plantings, and they they came up with a, a dwarf white pine and a dwarf um, blue blue spruce blue spruce yep. and that's what's been in the plans again for the last several revisions but the placement of them is what fell off of the plan so okay. that's the, they're on sheet C511 we're agreeable to Mr. Graham's suggestions thank you okay so, fine ma'am you had a comment the only comment was that I wouldn't want, I prefer something that the deer don't need. I think that's why we were talking about the blue spruce yeah. and, 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 and yes. right, the other deer. The higher these, uh, Mr. Graham, the higher these pine trees along the, uh, like, northern block line? I'm sorry, say it again to me. How tall will these be, these pine trees? I, I don't know. You can tell me probably better than that. I'd like them to be, like, Oh, oh, they propose plantings? Yes. They, they, they call out in their plans a mature height of 10 to 12 feet. And they're, they're the dwarf types. So you should call it a dwarf. I'm not a landscaper. Uh, if you call it a dwarf and you put in a two foot tree, it's probably going to grow an inch the rest of my lifetime. So I would like mandatory, you know, at least six feet, eight feet tall, go near me, and if they grow to 12 feet, that's great. Ma you're talking about max heights when in, when planted. Yes. Yep. I would like when they planted, minimum eight feet tall going in. I will consult with a, a landscaper and find out what the max height that could be planted that will survive because that you can plant one that's this big around but it's not going to survive. So you've got to plant the one that's yes. going to survive. And like I said, when you mentioned dwarf, we all know dwarf. They don't grow. Like I said, the dwarf pine tree might grow an inch. Maybe I'm exaggerating it for the rest of my life. So I need something, please. That's and I think you'd be planting something that would grow to mature height within three to five years of planting. That would be great. That would be great. Yes. I'll look into that. Excuse me, my last question, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, and I apologize, Tom. I'll just say, please. Right. One second. Now, are they going to cut on the northern boundary? I'm 
my understanding is they're going to cut right to the boundary line, or they're going to leave, or is it going to be from my boundary line, a 40 foot no yeah. cut? I don't know. Well, it appears to be uh, directly behind the barn, it puts up to 40 foot, and then as you get further to the. Uh, because I can't understand. Okay. Once we get the other barn, uh, once, once we get the other barn, we're clear to. to Five feet of the property line, right? And then we can just just for this short section, and then we're going to deviate back out, and then end up over here. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Chairman, another question: Next hand, a line of sight of those two dots on the end. We would ask you to put a line of sight of those two dots on the end. Thank you. Because they're not here. Yeah. Oh yeah. We'll we'll revise the lines. We'll show the the line of blue uh, spruce or combination blue spruce white line for the next. Thank you. Mr. Beatrice? Just to uh, reach back to the issue of screening and the type of trees that are suggested. The type of trees that are traditionally used as screening are, are chosen for a reason, and that's quick growth, uh, sure. maximum screening. And it, I've never seen it. You're not going to pluck a six foot uh, blue spruce or an eight foot blue spruce and replant it and find that. And it, so I think that request is slightly unreasonable. I, I don't think we're, we would certainly request, it's not something we're going to just just work with uh, right. uh, experts right. in the field to tell us what would be appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Grace? Sorry, I just, I tried to, to stop you guys earlier when Mr. Graham was talking, but I just, back to Mr. Graham's letter, that, um, the July 25th letter, I just had a, one question um, for the board. One was obviously that um, one of the um, statements that Mr. Graham had written in his letter that says, we remain of the opinion that the previously mentioned alternate drive locations are possible solutions to all of these problems that we're all talking about. But it seems to me like that kind of has gone by the wayside. And for me, an easier solution would be the alternate drive that we have talked about, and we wouldn't be dealing with all these problems and solutions. But I don't know why that keeps being pushed backwards. Um, so that's a big concern that I have. The other concern that I have, as far as the storm water, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but the storm water drainage system that's going to be visible on Weathersfield Street. Kurt, I had talked to you about that, and you had recommended that I go over to the um, Rally Country Club area and look at those areas. So I guess my question is, when I went over there, there are two separate areas there. One is a very small area that is filled with like several rocks. The other is a very large open area that um, it has grass in it with a few trees here and there. So I didn't really understand which exactly area am I supposed to be visualizing in my head as far as the stormwater Right, right, right. I wasn't saying that that's what it is. No, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand in my mind what, how this is going to look from Weathersfield Street, because I also thought that one of the recommendations from the board was that the, um, as you drive down Weathersfield Street, that this would not be a visible eyesore to people. And the more I listen to this, I, and I see their picture, there is a very large stormwater drainage area that is going to have to have chain link fencing. Um, and exactly how much clearing, when you're talking about the chain link fencing, what are you talking about in regards to the clearing of trees around this chain link fencing area? I don't think there's any chain link fence around that basin. Need to address? Do you want to address that? Uh, sure thing. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this basin is designed to drain out completely after each and every storm. So, there's, there's no requirement for a chain link fence. Right. Okay. And then, right. and this will be a um, the basin is overall dimensions are approximately 70 feet wide and uh, 60 feet like perpendicular off Weathersfield Street. And um, so it'll be chain so it'll be it'll be uh, grass. It'll, it'll it'll look like a lawn. I mean, it'll be a basin. There's, you know, no doubt about it. Uh, it'll be covered with lawn, and it'll be cut twice no twice place. a year. Okay. So I'm just like I said, I'm just trying to visualize this. So how how much are we talking about as far as clearing in regards to the um, what this is going to look like in Weathersfield Street as far as in regards to the driveway and the, uh, the stormwater drainage area? Like how much trees and this. Like going across there, are we expected to see 
Well, we're looking at uh, Plan C C1-11. Uh, yeah. If you notice the uh, the scallop line that runs around the, the driveway, that's the that's the delimitation of, of clear cutting. So that's the line where trees can be cut. And it, it really uh, is 15 is feet off the roadway and 100 feet wide. And 100 feet over. Uh, Hawaii, yeah. Not yeah. even to about 70 feet wide. 75 feet. feet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But but like when you add the road wide. into it, it's it's about a hundred by a hundred foot. Oh yeah, if well, you include the roadway, sure. So that that's, that's when you drive down Weathersfield Street, that's what right. So that's right. basically what I'm asking. Yeah. I'm driving down Weathersfield Street. I'm expecting to see a hundred feet clear cut of trees to service the driveway, and then an additional to service the, the storm and water no, drainage on the side. All together, hundred feet. So the storm water drainage in the driveway would be approximately the same amount of distance of clear cutting, I guess, for trees. All together, about 100 feet wide and 100 feet deep into the woods so will exactly, accommodate the basin and the driveway. So exactly where does the chain link fencing start? It only goes around the two array fields. Okay, so we won't be visualizing any of that. No. Okay. Yeah, it's um, okay. so, yeah, about 600 feet back. In that stormwater water drainage area, will... Um, is there like any way to have like trees placed there to look more natural as to just being like a, a hole? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we can't. So we can allow trees to grow on the berm up to the top of the berm, but not inside the basin. Right. So like around it, I guess I'm saying. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that it's going to be visually unappealing. It's just, it's a, it, it's really, just, it is a grass. It's grass in a natural state. It, correct. You know, right. I, oh. I don't necessarily. I, I think the other thing to note is that there is a berm on the Weathersfield Street side. In other words, you're driving down Weathersfield Street at plan elevation 50. The top of the berm is at 54. Mm -hmm. Your eye height is probably about level with the top of the berm. So you're not going to see down into it at all. Right. You're going to see the top of the berm, and then your eyes are going to go on up the hill as it rises okay. toward I guess it's just visually hard when you look at it on the paper. It looks like when I'm driving down the road, it's like, ooh, right there. You're not going right. to see the hole. Okay. The hole. Oh, okay. And um, I don't know if this is an appropriate time or not, but I do have a letter from um, Sarah Bajor, who was, um, lives on Weatherstool Street, and she was unable to be here, uh, that she wanted me to read to the board. So I'm going to do it now or at... Uh, if you wouldn't mind just hand it into the, the planner, we'll, we'll take it over. Well, I think she really wanted it to be addressed to here. To you know what, we, we do have to keep this process moving and people who didn't, I can't really open it up to comments from people that aren't even in attendance. But Mr. Chairman, we've been coming since January. January, don't you think yes, we should yeah. listen to one of the neighbors who, on the butter, a director butter? So, uh, can I, would you mind? You can read it if you want, I mean, it's like Can we get a copy, please, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I, I have to, uh, ask it. I feel like this is uh, a little bit verbose to start reading into the record at this point. And it does seem like it, it, it does take a... Yeah, I, I'm not going to read this letter. It seems like it, it deals with issues that go beyond her, her concern for the project. I mean, it, it, it delves with, into financial gain of the applicant. So I'm not really certain that that's a comment that we could going to find instructive. Uh, all right. So... Mr. Graham, relative to uh, the comments by the attorney for Mr. Cassiotis, is there anything else you wanted to, to comment on? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think we've uh, we've touched on the uh, the landscaping, which was a big part of uh, the letter from MTC. Uh, there, on um, the second full paragraph on page two, talks about. Uh, lines and poles which might be going up the roadway and connecting into uh, the inverter pads and so forth. The plans call for underground uh, all the way from Weathersfield Street uh, into the site. So there'll be no overhead uh, wires, no lines, no poles. Uh, 
Uh, the, it also talks about at the latter part of that paragraph some changes which they were unable to discern in the change of plans from July 3rd to July 18th. I look closely at that, and, and I do see those changes having been made, and I think that the plans uh, represented on July 18th and today, July 30th, that I've scanned, uh, do represent the fact that the array fields were moved, uh, as opposed to what that letter suggests. Uh, we talked about the uh, clearing and the landscaping. Uh, the letter also suggests um, about 16 different items that uh, they've mentioned. Uh, if you'd like me to go through them one by one, because I, I appreciate this letter because the board has tasked me, again, I said, to uh, help them write the, the detailed uh, specifications for the conditions for this approval. And uh, many of these items which they listed here will be conditions of approval. Uh, and I can go through them one by one if you'd like, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think it's uh, fair enough because we'll might as well start the discussion about conditions as well. So if you want to hit on those items, and particularly the ones that you think are relevant sure. and be incorporated into our conditions. Uh, the first one is the setback of the facility and all related utilities from the shared property lines should be at least 150 feet. The only thing I would point out there is uh, the shared property line is the shared property lines between uh, Mr. Cas or the Casiotis's and the applicant and not other property lines which are greater or less. Uh, it should be indicated on the plan a no cut zone of at least 50 feet in parentheses. We've established a nine if the board's comfortable with it. Their plans indicate a little over 40 feet, I'd say, you know, 40, 45 feet. Uh, and with the additional vegetative screening, which they have uh, not appropriately approved to tonight, I think uh, I'm okay with that. Good. All fencing around the perimeter should have openings to allow for the transition of wildlife that are able to jump the fence. Um, the plans do call for the six inch uh, under, and that is specified in the state uh, guidelines for uh, this type of development. And whether or not a, uh, wildlife can jump the fence, uh, I would say if they can jump in, they can jump out. <laughs> because the whole array fields, unless they're born, uh, they're going to be able to get in and get out. Uh, the, the work hours will certainly be established as a condition. Numbers five and six uh, deal with the proposed panels. And I know that over time, I have seen some specifications of the panel dimensions, the panel angles, you know, but we have been down a long road here. I don't have that, you know, in my files, uh, clearly. I would like to see it on the CAMIT plans if that's possible. If not, then I'd like to see a supplemental sheet or two added to the approved set of plans so that we have them in the, in the planning board office so and not have to try to find them in the, you know, in this, this long protracted process. So we're talking about a profile and elevation? Of no, the, it, the no, just, just what they've asked for here. Okay. Uh, especially how long are they, how high are they, how are they supported, uh, what's the angle, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that goes into perhaps whether or not there'll be any glare in the direction of uh, Cassiotis or anyone. So I think that information needs to be finalized now that we appear to be getting toward the end of this process so that there's no question as to what we expect to be built there as far as the board or the abutters. Uh, applicant must provide a detailed construction schedule. Uh, they provided one in the plans. Uh, you can only go so, so far with that. Uh, I'll look at that again, but my, my previous look at it said, yeah, that's, that's pretty much okay. Uh, we talked about the stump grinding, and we'll have to iron out a condition that, that works for everybody there. Uh, the applicant should be prohibited from blasting. Um, I think that, um, you know, they're only going to take off the top of a couple of hills. Uh, 
I throw that out probably to the board or to the applicant. Is, is prohibiting blasting something we want to have in there, or do we want to <clears throat> allow them to blast if they need to under the under the guidelines and the regulations which which govern them through the fire department and all that stuff? I mean, I would think that. I doubt you're going to need to blast, right? Maybe no, we hydraulic can on the worst case. Saying, Mr. Chairman, there shouldn't, my client should not be held to a higher standard than anyone else who won a project in the state of Massachusetts. That's ridiculous. No, Why should they be held to a higher standard? I'm with you. I, mean, it, it, I think obviously you need to do blasting. You need to do it pursuant to the regulations of the government. Just like every other project. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Sandra Cassio, 579 Weathersfield Street. There's homes around there. I mean, there's state blasting. regulations right. that there's protect homes. you. So yeah. there's, there's blasting that happens in a lot of projects. There's blasting happens for the golf course in my backyard. Be advised the Absolutely, because all that is very well regulated. Where am I going to put our horses when they blast? That's why they'll give you plenty of notice. And, and the thing is, we, and who's going to pay for the horses to be moved? And I can't answer all those questions for you, but I do think we can't deny somebody the right to develop the land. The, the alternative to blasting in those small areas might be to, to drill and split. It might be more disruptive than uh, one or two shots of... Uh, Hydraulic handling, we're hearing that all day. Days and days and days. Uh, moving on. Uh, pro prohibited from milling any wood on the site. I think that's reasonable. Uh, I, I don't think setting up a, a milling operation there should be necessary or should be approved. Uh, erosion control, yes, that's all set. Reseeding will be a condition, very important one, how that's done. Uh, dust control will definitely be a condition, uh, probably a condition that says that there'll be, a, at all times during the construction, a water tank on site. Uh, and the power cleaning measures at the uh, Weatherfield Street Road, they do have in their plans a uh, a construction entrance detail, which will be one of the first things that goes in. And when, if that clogs up and needs to be replaced, that's what you do with those things. But that will, that 75 foot run of a construction road uh, will keep the uh, debris and dirt off the Weatherfield Street. And if not, they're required to clean it. We'll shut them down until it's clean if we need to. So, who do we, who do we come to? We have issues during this whole process that we feel so things aren't done properly, like the cleaning of the road you're talking about, and the street and things like that. So, what is our recourse? Of you can always speak to the, the building inspector, the building inspector's department, and uh, he'll go out and make sure that they're in compliance. Please, sir. Okay, thank you. So, uh, based on uh, there's two more things. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> the uh, the delivery of panels and installation uh, and traffic plan and so forth. That basically will be the same as the hours of operation. Uh, there shouldn't be anything being delivered outside of those hours of operation at night or anything else. Hours of operation means everything. Right. Delivery, construction, everything. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that. The, the uh, delivery of an installation of materials, panels, delivery of those things, all should be in the uh, confines of the hours of operation. Not outside, not at night. Delivering the panels at night to be erected the next day, no. Is 7.30 to 4.30? I think that's unreasonable. Well, I didn't look at the, uh, the 7.30 or 4.30. Monday through Friday only. Yeah, I'm going to look at the uh, conditions which I have here of the other two projects that this board has approved and try to stay as consistent with them as we can. Uh, um, and they had 7 to 6 Monday through Friday. Uh, so maybe some modification. May I, again, I, I, I know that it'll be, it'll be up to the board. I just want to make one comment. I know that the applicant has the rights, but I have some rights. I have a young rider, nine-year-old lady, young girl, probably going to get out of school and come and ride her bus. So this blasting going on, uh, chipping, destroying trees, you know, she's rising the ring. You see how close it is to the northern boundary. I'm very concerned about her health and her welfare. 
and to be. I don't want her to be thrown from the hospital because all of a sudden something happens. So I think and I believe 7.30 to 4.30 is very reasonable, Monday to Friday only. This way it gives her the opportunity to come after that. They've had a 10, 12 hour day, whatever. Uh, plenty of time for probably breaks, lunch, and in my riding to come and enjoy her bus. And, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's reasonable as well. Uh, I, I also think that as we often do on uh, construction sites or buildings and so forth, that uh, perhaps a Saturday operation might be permitted for, uh, say, erecting the panels only. No wood chipping, no, you know, no heavy lifting. No blasting. No blasting. But that would allow them, you know, a time on a Saturday. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be needed or not. But, you know, th these are things that need to be hashed out when these conditions are put before the board, the applicant, and the abutters. Thank you. Mr. Gingers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, just to jump back on the milling of wood on site, my client has been milling wood on that site for a number of years, and she shouldn't be prohibited from engaging in any activities that are authorized by the town in the context of the special permit procedure. That's an unreasonable restraint on her rights uh, as a homeowner, as a businesswoman, and as someone who mills wood on site. So I don't think that should be even remotely considered as a condition. Uh, Excuse me, where, all, has, where has the milling operation been conducted? Right on the farm, when we use the wood, when we have to do any type of repair. Well, I think, the, I think the point here is that to set up a milling operation in our like one of the two array fields, which is close to the abutters. But, you know, if it's taken to where it has been milled before and it's been historically milled and not bothering anybody, yeah, that's fine. and if that's in the compound of buildings, then perhaps that can be written that way. Mr. Chairman, I'm not, I'm not aware that it's bothered anyone in the past, but there's no intent to mill with it. Panels are going to be installed, obviously. Mm -hmm. But if they want to drag wood to a milling site anywhere else on the property, they have a right to do that. I think it's a farm thing anyway. It is. Really, you can't, kind of like Mario Marie, when you were uh, 12 years old, it's kind of a farm thing. And it's not noisy. Do you have a bandsaw or do you have the other kind? Bandsaw. Yeah, they're quiet. Um, so, so which of them? <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm sure what the, the nature of that re restriction is. Is it a noise issue? Is it a. Wood chip? What's the concern for milling wood on site? Yeah, because she doesn't have property. I can, I'm, what am I, a thousand feet from my property? The road's going 21 feet from my property line. These things are coming down. I believe the intent is to stop milling, making boards on, on, on this on site. I believe that's what the milling is. Right? Milling is making boards on the site. That, that Make is the boards and you mill it. No, I understand what you I, I, I get the fact that they want to take the uh, lumber and take it away. Okay. I'm trying to wait, you know, again, get the bit of an impact, noise, unsightliness, noise. It's a construction site. So, Mr. So, yeah, Chairman, so. I stated what my, my client's intention is, but I can tell you we will not agree as a condition to limit my client to any right she has, just like Mr. Cassiotis has on his lawn. She has a right to develop her property, and if she has a right to mill under the zoning right regulations on anywhere in her property other than where the panels are. She shouldn't be constrained to do so by this board. I, I'm not sure. We'll, uh, we'll deal with that as, as we put together the conditions, but I agree with uh, Mr. Beatrice that uh, they, as a matter of right, they can do it today, so they can do it uh, going forward as well. Second. That being said, we're not setting up a mill, and you're not going to be milling in the, in, in the array fields or in the roadways. So, Second. Uh, Second point, Mr. Chairman, not to cut you off, on the hours of operation, I don't see why we should be held to a different standard I, I think I'm going to be, uh, I think it's going to be instructive on the decision I would make to, to look at what we've done in the past. It seemed to work in those instances, and I don't think they've been overly restrictive, and I think that uh, it's going to be consistent with what you're going to, your people are going to need. Hi, Sir. In terms, I have one other comment. Yeah. In terms of the panels, yeah. uh, it's been uh, very difficult uh, due to circumstances internationally uh, and the uh, tariff issue to actually get a lock on the panels that are going to be used. Um, and I can rec represent to the board that my client, in terms of the screening and the setbacks and all the issues that we have gone through, has um, 
approach this screening issue from the standpoint where there would be uh, reflection and unsightliness and things of that nature and provide what would, what would be necessary to accommodate the worst case scenario for these families, which is not going to be the case because since the last two projects were approved, the panels have been approved technologically. Mm -hmm. So to require my client to uh, disclose those panels uh, as a condition uh, in order to get the permit, I think is a little bit unreasonable as long as she, unless she has a time frame in which to submit those, because we cannot put a uh, definite. I mean, can we? Uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. In fact, that was one of the questions I needed to ask to you: what your what your ability to provide that information that we're requesting? Could we, if we were to say prior to the issuance of the building permit? We have to provide all of that anyway. We have to provide it to the assessor. We have to provide it for the building permit. Sure. And the panels, uh, they've changed so so much in the past couple of years. They use commonly the largest uh, commercial airports in the country, mm -hmm. use solar panels on the airfield because they're, they're designed and engineered to absorb light, not to reflect. That was an engineering issue that, you know, they seem to have worked out. So we will definitely be disclosing down to the invert every single component mm -hmm. that will be used, but the procurement process has taken place dozens of times since we started, and we have a few <coughs> additional constraints between tariffs and other issues that have come up. We already, today we have a, a list of what we hope to be able to use, but until such time that we actually have it, the items can change. And that's from the companies that we purchased from as well. So we'll give everything. It's there's nothing that is hidden. It's all transparent. Mr. Graham, could, could you uh, devise some parameters for what type of? I know. I mean, this is an an open, uh, as far as the, the size of the panels we're looking for, the, the angle that we would be willing to uh, accept, the brackets that would would work for, because it, it sounds like they can't tell us what they're going to procure until they have an approval. Well, I, I think if, if, the, if the board writes in a condition prior to obtaining a building permit for the erection of the panels, that you get a chance to look at them, and we then can uh, assess what you just asked about. Sure. Uh, and be sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're not casting any glare anywhere. That's the main concern. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a reasonable uh, request of the applicant, but I still think before they go up, the board needs to see them, and apparently there's a process for that to happen. Sure. It's, it's, we don't mind that condition at all. We, as, as she stated, at Pawnee State, it's a tier one product. I mean, we, this is high range. Really like so we're happy to do that as long as it's not, um, doesn't preclude the permit. It's a condition of the permit to be met down the road in terms of the building permit. That's what absolutely. we're suggesting, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and, I mean, you don't know what you're going to have, so we don't know what you're going to have. Yeah. So yeah. we'd like yeah. to just yeah. make sure that what you end up with is yeah. consistent with what we're intending to approve. So, okay, we can deal with that issue. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm just concerned about our well. What effect lasting would have on our well? That, again, is the, the regulations by the state provide indemnity for those type of things and, and, and determine liability. Uh, so if we end up, end up getting there, it's not going to be this board that's going to decide. It's going to be it's going to be the state blasting regulations that are going to mandate how that notice goes out and who's liable. I think it's a strict liability uh, undertaking, so if, if there's a problem, they're going to be liable for it. Is there anything that we need to do before to say that this has happened after the blasting? They do a pre-blast survey on your house to make sure oh, everything is. Yeah, exactly. So that covers them, that covers you. All blasters do it. They have their own insurance to cover themselves, cover you. So. Is there anybody else uh, here from the community that has a comment? It's there's a pre-blast survey done by uh, the blaster pays the blaster, for the bloody blaster applicant. Company, as mandated by law. As in what? If, if they elect, I can't tell you, I don't know the regs, but if they determine that they need to blast on site, they'll have to go to the regulations and comply. And that compliance really requires notice to all the butters, absolutely. Okay. If you're within the blast, 
previous that they determine requires notice, you'll get that notice. If you're getting that notice, you're also going to get a pre-blast uh, survey to determine what the property condition is so that you have something to measure it against in the event that it's a problem. Another question, Mr. Chairman. What would the notice be? I mean, will it be the day of the blast? I, I honestly can't tell you, but I can tell you. So you know, no, it happens months in advance. It happens. There's yes. plenty of time for this. Oh, like a show up with a couple of months. Yeah, normally. Okay, yeah. Sir? Can this project be expanded upon in the future? So once this permit closes, is it grandfathered in that they can come back and say, okay, we want to do another Nothing about what we're proving today precludes them from seeking an additional permit, but nothing about what we're doing today or considering today would, uh, would would open the door to further expansion either. So they'd have the same rights they'd have, they have today to come in and, and permit for a, a different use of the property. With, with one exception, I think, that I, and that's the use of the driveway. Cor oh, correct. The use of the driveway. This driveway is right, committed to this use. Anyone else? Could I approach that plan and ask one question? I know it's getting my decision. Yeah, sure, please. I know you have a child and I don't want to do And I don't want to do Thank you. Okay. So, uh, it's in my letter, uh, page six, if I may approach Mr. Green to ask this question. On the July 13th, from my bar, let's see, from my bar, Okay, so the July The barn is right there. It's, it's the yellow the square. square. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So anyways, from my barn, okay, let me just say, the July 3rd transit, 120 feet. I know it's a non-compliance test, so I can get that. Okay, so from the barn to the array field was 277 feet. Okay. Now I look at the plan, and I look at the July 30th plan. Now it's 151 feet. Okay, which I guess is in compliance. But from the bond to the array field, it's only 284 feet. That tells me it's seven feet. Now, I haven't moved the bond south 27 feet, so I'm just curious as to why is that only seven feet if, if it's been moved 31? That's uh, I, I looked at that point specifically, uh, Mr. Cassiotis, and I compared those two plans, and if you look very closely, even without putting a scale to it, you can see that their array fields moved further away by that seven feet. Well, that's from 177 to, or 277 to 287. Okay. And my last point is this array here, they show the point, again, this is engineering 101 for me, I guess, so um, I'm a novice here. So from that corner lot, it shows 154 feet. Okay, that's great. But what about from my line to the end of the year? It doesn't look like 154 feet. You know, a straight line. I mean, I've got, I have, you got an angle shot. Again, I don't have a truck to me all you. A straight line doesn't tell me that's 154 feet. So from my line on the western boundary, you go straight. Not at an angle. An angle always is a uh, longer distance. If I remember my college map. You take a straight line. The straight line does not show no straight line. And I, I figured out finally that the 132 feet is to the road. Okay. But I, 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 don't, I don't feel that it's still 150 feet from behind my house, you say. See this line right here? Yes. I'm sure. If you look at my property line, I don't think that's 150 feet. But again, this is. I mean, 133. Well, I, I did not look specifically at that. But I have a scale tonight. Mr. Blanchett could uh, scale off uh, where you're talking about from your property line to that array field. It does uh, not look at all. Your, your plans indicate from his corner 154 feet uh, to the closest point on the array field. To the road. So from the house to the road, it's 133. Right. And then it's well, the one 154 is accurate. Okay. All right. So from there to there, yeah. yeah. That's 154. Road. And then from the front house to the end of the road. But if I slide it's down, it actually gets further away, right? Because right. the okay. it doesn't show from the property one, but he just scaled it. No, again. 
it looks like Mr. Casiota said the uh, as you slide to the south uh, along your property line from a right field number one, that 154 increases to each uh, row of panels, and the last row of panels, most subtly row, is 180 feet from your property line. So we'll certainly be taking a look at all those distances to make sure there's compliance, but it sounds like uh, Okay. Before, we close the meeting, before we close the meeting, I do have a couple of issues I'd like to raise. Please. If I may. As you know, um, when the bylaw, the new bylaw was approved the town meeting, um, subsequent to that, the board asked my client to withdraw the site plan review application and file a special permit application. Mm -hmm. uh, we declined to, file, to uh, recall the site plan, uh, site plan review application, and I want to explain why very briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, the bylaw change is dependent on the Attorney General's Office approving. So come September or, or thereof, if the Attorney General's Office approves the new bylaw, then whatever is done or has been done on the site plan review becomes moot, getting back to April 30th, the day of the meeting. However, if the Attorney General's office denies the bylaw change, then the site plan review is still active, and the special permit proceeding that we're under right now becomes moved. So it's been my client's uh, position to administer both at the same time, and that's one of the reasons why we've done so. And ancillary to that, under the site plan review, which we're under now, um, a couple of things. One is that my client would request a, provis a provisional permit under the site plan review so she can use that permit for pre-development planning and the necessary things she has to do uh, in order to get this project off the ground into fruition in a timely manner. So formally, we would request that from the board. So you're asking us to act on the site plan review application? What I'm asking tonight is for you to act on the site plan review application by issuing a provisional permit, knowing full well that that permit may become moot or may not become moot down the road. It's, but it's a provisional permit. It's not a final approval of the site plan review application. I mean, I, procedurally, I'm not sure we have the, uh, we don't have the mechanism to issue a provisional permit. I mean, I, I can understand the rationale for it. And what do you need to say? I have no idea what he's talking about. Yes. That being said, he's just asking us to, to, to give them their belt and suspenders in the event that uh, the AG does not approve the bylaw amendment that was uh, approved by the town in, uh, on April 30th. So, he's, so you're saying basically if the Attorney General... Approve it the old way and approve it the new way. He's so asking. this could change? I don't want to open up to what... what well, that's not what I'm saying. Do you see what he's saying? I can I can clarify it to the board. Um, because of the bylaw change, the approved by town meeting, that bylaw change is not law until the attorney general approves it. So whatever is done with respect to this special permit proceeding or the site plan review application is subject to the attorney general's. Uh, approval and disapproval of the bylaw. If the Attorney General disapproves the bylaw, then the site plan review application is still active. If the Attorney General approves the bylaw, then that site plan review becomes moot and the special permit is active, which is why we're administering both at the same time. What I'm simply asking tonight, even though I actually think that the site plan review application has already been constructively approved, I don't even want to go down that road. I'm not asking for the approval tonight, although I think I have a right to do so. I'm just asking for what's known as a provisional permit, short of that slight plan review approval, in order for my client to utilize to continue this project on. We're not going backwards. So you're We're asking for going a, forwards. A, a conditional approval or provisional, provisional, provisional approval permit. of the site plan, this site plan, pursuant to the site plan process that was begun in November. Well, it's not that, it's not as simple as that. It would be the last plan that was uh, um, 
submitted on the site plan review. And I can tell you this, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah. is, is, and I know that's maybe a scary uh, prospect, not just for you, but for us, because we spend a lot of time to get where we're at now. My right. only concern is, the, the two concerns I think that are most important is two, we're all dependent on the Attorney General's office, and there's a great chance that they're going to approve the bylaw, but they may not. And whatever you approve, if you do so, with respect to a provision of use permit, once that, and, it, and that would be used pre-construction, okay, nothing's, no one's going to uh, break no ground on it. That is likely going to become moot in September, mm -hmm. but has value to us between now and September. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I speak? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm going to request, the bylaw specifically says minimum of 150 feet from my property. Minimum. At this point, I'm in question 200 feet on the northern boundary, 200 feet on the western boundary. Thank you. So, uh, Kirk, do we, we don't, we, we've never done a provisional approval. Your assertion that it's constructively, that the site plan review is constructively approved. I'm not sure what that would be. I don't even want to open that up tonight. Because okay, but you did mention it. Yeah, well, it's my opinion. Yeah, but I'm not sure what that's based on. I, I mean, uh, we, I, I think it was, a, it was part of the board's uh, willingness to actually uh, be accommodating uh, to, to take the existing site plan that was currently under review, continue that review uh, with the addition of the special permit um, uh, application in light of the, of the new bylaw. So I think that this was based on accommodation by the board well, I'm, not to, try, I'm not trying to trick the I'm board. I'm just saying that there's been a lot of progress made on this particular site plan. The board can still actually, even under the site plan, under the site plan bylaw, just with a different criteria, you know, make, uh, assert the same conditions I, as what's being... I actually don't agree with that uh, respectfully, but I'll tell you why. Because when we got uh, the correspondence to withdraw the site plan review application, and filed a special mm -hmm. permit application. Mm -hmm. We filed a special permit, we did not withdraw. And in that correspondence with respect to the site plan review application, uh, that correspondence from the board said the board would not act on that site plan review application. However, we did ask. You're saying for the, what we, in the response from, from the board? Yes. Okay. Notwithstanding that, Mm -hmm. And I, I, at the meeting, I did suggest that I disagreed that you actually had an obligation to, to yeah. either deny it, approve it, or what have you. I just asked that we continue to try mm -hmm. to sort through this. And that was the last meeting. At the last meeting, though, however, please hear me out. If you look at the uh, tape, and I haven't looked at it, but I remember what I said. I asked that we continue the meeting for the special permit as a special meeting because of the issues that were before us in our uh, um, desire to get a special permit, um, obtain a special permit. I did not ask to continue the site plan review here. And that was not continued to tonight. I didn't ask for it to be continued to August 8th. And my obligation is to my client. So I, I actually believe it's already been constructively approved, but I, no one wants a lawsuit. But you, you believe it's been constructively approved because we didn't act on it? Yes. Even though it's going to become moot in September if the AG approves the bylaw, I still think. Why would it be concerned? I'm not. So, so, so a couple of things, and I, I, I think we're about to close this meeting and continue it to the to the next meeting. But that sure. being said, you know, I don't know that we have the, uh, the procedure to create a pro provisional approval. So right there, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to act on that tonight because we're without the means to do that, sure. without more information. Beyond that, you're, you're suggesting that we would consider a plan that may have been considered and reviewed by Mr. Graham, but we don't have a final review on it, and we don't have a final uh, uh, submission from you, so I don't see how we could approve a plan that we haven't taken a final look at. I totally understand the position the board's in, yeah. but I also understand what the law requires in terms of taking action on that site plan, uh, app, site plan review application. And uh, I haven't changed my opinion on it, and maybe we never get to that issue, but I'm actually hopeful that we don't. All I'm simply asking for, and I'll put it in writing uh, uh, to the chairman and I'll CC town council and Mr. Graham uh, to request that provisional use permit. 
And I often will also set up my position on the constructive Can you send a copy of that law, too, so we can get what I believe you to? Absolutely. You just, absolutely. If we vote the wrong thing, we'll be fine. So, so <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, ask that we continue this meeting to uh, the, the next hearing, or next uh, date, which is August, August 8th. 8th. Yes, can I just ask a question? I would agree to continue the special permit. Here, which we're doing, and I also will let you know that we are going to make every effort to comply with all the suggestions made by Mr. Graham by the board, taking into consideration the public's input uh, well in advance of the next meeting, so that we can hopefully uh, put those issues together. Well, I think we're that seems to be the inclination of, of the board, and I'm hoping to Mr. Graham, based on where, where we're at in this process and the comments you got from Cameron today. Do you think it's realistic to think that we could have some proposed conditions available for the next meeting? I should have them out to Kirk by the end of, the, end of this week. Yeah, thank you. Great. So that would put us in, in line to do that. Thank you. Uh, all right, now we're continuing the special permit hearing uh, until to August 8th. Correct. We're not taking any action on the, the site plan because it's not on for tonight. Correct. Okay. But I, I, I would ask the board to consider, consider the provisional uh, permit, and I will put that request in writing. Uh, and so, so, you know, I'm not saying we're not going to. I, 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 I think uh, we would consider, you know, we'll, we'll look at our agenda for the 8th, and, and if, if it's appropriate to bring that matter forward, we will. Okay? And, and, uh, and, and, you know, and with the intention to take simultaneous action on both, uh, so that you can walk out of here potentially with, you know, if we can determine that we have a process we can allow provisional approval, you know, deal with, with the, the site plan as a just, provisional. With the understanding that everything is dependent on the Attorney General's office. Well, I understand why you want to. In the law, otherwise to, yeah. we wouldn't be in the situation that we're right. in. Yeah. Well, All right, I, so. Can I put some? Uh, yeah, please. Well, as far as the special, with the, uh, being able to uncouple the special permit and the site plan review, they're, they, they have to go in tandem as far as the bylaw is concerned. The, the actual review itself is a special permit slash site plan review. The site plan accompanies the special permit review. And we've actually, with this, the, all the concrete elements of this review are site plan review. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't see how you can um, decouple those two, uh, those two elements. I mean, I think what he's suggesting is that they're two different applications, though. Yeah, the one for the new bylaw. Right, so, so right. Right. And then the one for the old bylaw. But I, 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 I don't understand how, how the other one is is not presumed to be continued along with and to, to accompany these. Uh, it, was a, it was an act of accommodation on the part of the board to not require a new site plan because we already had a site plan. The only element that wasn't was the actual uh, special permit review. At the point that the special permit review was submitted, that they be those two became coupled together. And and that's why I understand it, but I, I just don't want to run the risk if, if you're suggesting something here, if we go down that road, where so you're trying to say that they're decoupled and you've actually, all you end up doing is derail the whole process, call the whole procedure into question. I don't. I, I want to. No, no, I, I, just so I, I maybe I don't know if I'm clarifying or trying to understand. In your view, we have a site plan review from November of 2017 that we have to consider, and we have to consider that because it's potential the AG might deny uh, our amendment. So act on that. And then separately, act on the site plan review and special permit application, which was submitted subsequent to the April amendment. And so that's what we're here on today, and we'll continue until the 8th, uh, and potentially act on it. But it's your position that the site, special permit and site plan review that we potentially will act on on the 8th is separate from and apart from the site plan review from that started in November of 2017. I think the bylaw requires that. Because it requires I mean, I see the, I see the reasoning because, if it, you know, yeah. hypothetically, in theory, if the, if the AG strikes down the amendment, then we're stuck with it, considering this plan pursuant to Site yeah. The site plan review criteria that was established. And if we withdrew that application and the AG uh, denied right. the bylaw, we'd have nothing. We'd have to start all over. Yeah. Right. Mr. Chairman, Sandra Cassio, this 579 if we're waiting for the Attorney General's office, why don't we just suspend hearings until we get the So this is why I'm kind of done with public intake at this point? Sorry. We're talking about procedure at this point. We're not talking about 
impact. So procedurally and administratively, uh, we're going to continue this hearing. Can I get that? Would, uh, it, would it be a, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Would it be appropriate to close the public hearing now based on the fact that we're going to be looking at conditions? Well, I think we have a, I think we have a, you know. Mr. Chairman, would it that be an insult to everyone who voted for the 150 feet minimum, minimum back in April 2018? I don't think that I'm not going to sit here and suggest that, that there's any insult to any of the voters in this town. So is that 150 feet away from everybody? No. Is that where we're approving? Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to motion that we continue this public hearing until August 8th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we have unanimous to continue to August, to April, August 8th, I'm sorry. And uh, at this point, <coughs> motion to close the meeting. I motion to close the meeting. Second. All in favor? 